Hello and welcome to this week's Trinity in 20. It's good to be with you. We hope that your week has been going well and that the week that lies before you has opportunities that you wouldn't have expected otherwise. As we begin today, the gospel lesson for this week is from the gospel of St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Now, all of the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property on dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So the son went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him out into the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands." So he set off and went to his father, but while he was still afar off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion, and he ran and he put his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son began to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him, and put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate." For this son of mine was dead and is alive again and was lost and now is found. And they all began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the fields. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called to one of the servants and asked what was going on. The servant replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then the elder son became angry and refused to go in. The father came out and began to plead with him. But the son answered the father, listen, for all of these years I have been working like a slave for you, and I have never disobeyed your commands, yet you have never given me even a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the gospel of the Lord. This past week, I had a conversation with somebody, and the conversation went a little bit like this. I have, the person said to me, I have a real problem with heaven. And I said, oh, what might that be? And the person said back to me, It seems like all we want to do in church is try to get us into heaven, try to get us into heaven when we die, but but that means all we're trying to do in this world is trying to get to heaven, and with so many problems in the world, that seems like, like, is that all that we have to talk about, is getting to heaven when we die? What about the world right now? I think it might be better if I don't even think about heaven. And I think that's an interesting conversation because it does seem so often that our conversation revolves around some sort of distant moment, or at least church has traditionally talked about these things, of some sort of distant moment when we get to leave this life, this existence, this time, this place behind us. And and admittedly, there is that sense that there is this hope for a day and a time of the restoration and the renewal of all things. In other words, we, we call that heaven. But as some of you know, that, that heaven is not the first thing necessarily on my mind, and I don't necessarily think that it was the first thing on Jesus' mind. Now, I don't think Jesus ever walked around and said to anybody, hey, if you follow me, you get to go to heaven when you die. And there's good evidence that in the early church, nobody even talked about that in a sense. Nobody said, you know, if you sign up with us, you'll get to go to heaven when you die. Instead, it sounded a little more like we're concerned about your life And we're concerned about this world right now. And we think that your life has meaning. We think you, as a person, have meaning no matter where you come from and no matter where you are. 
Would you come and be part of our organization? Would you come and be part of our mission and our ministry and our vision for the world? And in all of that, that is some sense that, that there is this abiding sense that Jesus' intent was to say this world should look more like the next life as opposed to trying to safely get us out of this life and into the next. And so, as we know, Jesus does a lot of that by telling stories. And in St. Luke chapter 15, there are actually three little stories that Jesus tells. He's gathered around himself some sinners and outcasts and people who were on the fringe of the world. And then also there, as you might imagine, there were some of the religious people, the Pharisees, church-going kind of, synagogue, church-going kind of people. And they're all there together. And all of them are, as you can imagine, it sounds in the story as if they're all grumbling about each other. It sounds a little bit like church, if you may. Everybody grumbling about the other one. And, and so Jesus decides to tell them a series of three stories. And all of them are about a thing that was lost. The first was about a man who lost a sheep and goes and finds it. Everybody's happy. Everybody's, you know, yeah, I understand that story. The second story is about a woman who loses a coin. And so she searches in her house diligently to try to find that coin. And everybody, you know, you can imagine everybody's going along. Yeah, I understand that story. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And then he tells this next story. And we've called this story the story of the prodigal son, and we throw focus there on that one younger son who occupies so much of the story. Now, clever preachers have also pointed out the story is also about the son, the older son, with a bad attitude, right? We understand that. And rarely, though, do we say there's also a story about a father who's messed up his family, right? Because clearly he was indulgent to the younger son, and maybe he was not as attentive to his older son as he should have been. And so there are all of these broken relationships. Right? That, that, that not only is the sheep lost or the coin lost, Jesus now steps into something far more complex, saying, here's a story of a whole family that is ruptured from one end to the other, from the father to the son to the older son to the younger son, and that somehow... In this story, we see our whole life. And, and the resolution to this is not quite as simple as finding a coin. It's not as simple as finding a lost sheep. It is the restitution of a whole family, of everybody together, trying to find their way, trying to be a sense of blessed and blessing and living in this world. And, and what's amazing about the story is, is that it's left open-ended. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know whether or not the father and the elder son ever restored their relationship. We don't know what happened after that party. And in that sense, it's as if this gospel lesson is opened up to us, that it is open to us to figure out how we're going to move forward in this story in this life, that if heaven is about the restoration of all things to their proper order, what this little story shows to us is that that is going to be hard. That is going to take effort. That is going to take intentionality on all of our parts, that God's world would become a fuller sense of the presence of this world. There, there is no secret. Uh, the problems that circulate in our world take the effort of all of us, because all of us are part of this world. All of us are interconnected with each other. I mean, the, the sense of from pandemic to Ukraine to social justice, all of us are involved in it because it touches all of our lives. I think that part of this story that has remained hidden to us is that this is an invitation to all of us in this Lenten season, in this life, in this time, to say it's worth working for it that our goal is not just an escape plan, but the restoration of all things back into God's order. May God's peace be with us in this Lenten journey, and may that sort of restoration of our lives and the lives of those around us be part of our Lenten goal this year. Peace to you. Amen.
As we travel through this Lenten season, it is good for, you, for us to be together with you. We wish you God's peace wherever you find yourself. There are many activities and opportunities that are part of our life together on our website, trinityenglish.org. You can see any number of those. We would invite you to participate, to join, to be part of our lives together here. May God's peace be with you through the course of this week. We continue today with our prayers. Let us pray in this Lenten season for those in need, for our journey, and for peace. Gracious God, we continue our Lenten journey of knowing our ways are ones of disobedience to your commands and of your expectations to love you and others. We ask that you give us the courage to make this journey with patience, forgiveness, and hope. Keep reminding us that we are not alone in our Lenten discipline, but accompanied by your grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, one of the traditions of the Lenten season is sharing our gifts with others. Inspire us to reach out to those who need us with our time, talent, and treasure. Guide us in our ways of generosity. Open our ears to those who need someone to listen to them and not judge them. Help us to be generous with our abundance. Grant us the wisdom to make this Lenten journey one of open hearts as well as open roads. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listening, God, we know that an integral part of this journey is spending more time in holy conversation with you. Keep reminding us that this time with you is asking your help to bring healing, hope, and happiness to others, not just for ourselves. We especially remember at this time those who ask us to pray for them. Anne Engel and Sharon, and Jenny Hobby and family, Wendy and Robin, the Dara family, Penny and Josh's family, Herman Hams, the family of Don Douglas, Carol and Cole and Nathan, Julie Goulet and Bob Anderson, Erica, Mary, Alan Bess, those experiencing heart problems, Joyce and her family, Chris Bickle, Marilyn, Carol Shear, Beth Ann, and Shirley. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, turn every heart to the true love of peace. We pray in solidarity with all the children of God in Ukraine, now in harm's way and subject to the violence of war. Allow our hearts to be one with those who strive for justice, peace, and respect, and dignity for every human being. We pray for leaders of nations that their hearts and minds would turn to justice and peace for their own people, for their neighbors, and for the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, our Lenten journey would not be complete if we did not remember the guidance of your Holy Spirit as witness through those who have gone before us and do now dwell with you in person. Number us among these saints and lights so that we may join them one day in singing your eternal praises. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask all these things and those you heard in our hearts in the name of the one whose journey included death on the cross, thus making it possible for us to have this confident conversation. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.